Hi, I'm Phil Harbottle and this is my 38th video discussing 1950s British science fiction. Now by 1954 nearly all of the British hardcover houses were jumping on the science fiction bandwagon following the successful lead of firms like Grayson & Grayson. One later entrant was the venerable publishing house of Ward Lock Limited, who specialised in popular genre novels, westerns, romances and crime fiction. By the early 1950s, Ward Lock had also instituted a paperback line, Target Books, which reprinted a selection of their own hardcover titles. Now, until 1954, they had avoided science fiction, although several of their crime thrillers had borderline science fiction elements, such as The Green Rust by Edgar Wallace, and in particular, Operation Superman by Hector Horton in 1951, which they actually labelled as a scientific thriller. And also, in 1953, they'd even published a full-blown science fiction novel Dr. Zill's Experiment by George Goodchild, but they presented it disguised as a mystery and adventure novel. This overlooked novel is an interesting exploration of a group of people projected into a strange future where nearly all the animal life on the earth has been destroyed. Now then, whilst the publishers were reprinting American science fiction, Wardlock commendably decided to stick to original novels by uh, homegrown writers and uh, of course they were setting out on their own experiment with science fiction. The first two titles appeared in July 1954, Colonist of Space by Charles Carr and The Wheel in Space by Rafe Bernard. Both jackets boldly proclaimed the science fiction uh, label. The author names were unknown. Carr was the pseudonym of crime and western writer Sidney Charles Mason, who had been detailed to try science fiction. I know nothing about Bernard, but would guess that it was probably the real name of a journalist, since the same byline turned up 13 years later on one of the Invaders TV novelizations. Carr described the voyage, the first uh, interstellar expedition, the voyage of the first starship in the spaceship Colonist. The ship's crew contains a large number of unscientific ratings hovering on the edge of mutiny. The authors seemingly had only the vaguest notion about interstellar distances and the speed of light. By constantly accelerating, the ship reaches another solar system and no reference is made to the light barrier or time paradoxes. The crew merely experience slight physical and mental discomfort. They reach the planet Bell and set up a colony. They then learn, learn of a catastrophic world war after they've left, which had destroyed life on Earth, making a return trip unfeasible. So they have no alternative but to become colonists of space. The main inspiration for this novel uh, seems to have come from the book or the movie adaptation of When Worlds Collide. But even if completely lacking in originality and scientific plausibility, the novel was competently written. It also had a rather striking colour cover jacket by uh, Harold Johns. Although it was unsigned, it was clearly the work of this artist. Johns had previously worked under the direction of famed artist Frank Hampson on the superb science fiction comic strip Dan Dare, serialised in the Eagle comic. But after two years, he'd left the Hampson studio at the freelance. Unlike author Carr, Johns knew science fiction. In the jacket illustration, shown the ship having landed on a strange rocky planet, was quite attractive. Bernard's novel, The Wheel in the Sky, showed more attention to scientific detail and describes the building of Earth's first manned space station. The story was clearly inspired by current non-fiction books by Arthur C. Clarke 
will you learn others. However, the author betrayed his rookie credentials by referring at one point to a flaming meteor in space. Set in the then near future, the story was a kind of Cold War soap opera in space, but it was competently written. But again, the most impressive thing about the book was its John's cover, showing the partially constructed wheel-like space station in orbit. The third title was uh, by uh, another unknown, John Elton, whose The Green Plantations appeared after a six-month gap in January 1955, but it was a seriously flawed story. Oloid is an Earth-like inhabited planet said to have remained unsuspected and hidden behind Mars since the dawn, the dawn of time. The Eloidians simply did not suspect the existence of the Earth. An unexplained aberration in its orbit had suddenly exposed the existence of each planet to the other. The sheer stupidity of this idea and apparent ignorance of basic celestial mechanics marks out Elton as another of Wardlock's genre writers detailed to try science fiction. He was journeyman, crime and romance writer John Marsh, who was on Wardlock's list. Weakened by a self-inflicted atomic war, Earth is conquered and colonised by the Eloidians. However, they cannot live for prolonged spells on Earth without an alien chemical compound produced by a plant on the green plantations back on their home planet. This Achilles heel enables Earth insurgents to throw off the alien yoke. But by far the best thing about the book was its cover. Another nicely coloured and balanced painting by Harold Johns, done in the Dan Day style with Hamsonian spacesuits and alien spacecraft. The fourth title was Conditioned for Space by Alan Ash, published in April 1955. Ash had never been heard of before and was destined never to be heard of again, at least under that name. This was an atrocious space opera. The astronomical details and background are utterly ludicrous. The plot offensively illogical and downright stupid. It staggers on until its unbelievably idiotic climax when the hero marries his beautiful alien princess. And then, well, you'll just have to read it and disbelieve it for yourself. This book is rank. It may have been by the same author as The Green Plantation, since the author blithely introduced another new planet, Ectolon, into the solar system, this time without rhyme or reason. The alien planet is inhabited by evil warrior women who speak perfect English, intent on invading our Earth in flying saucers. The whole thing is pervaded by a ludicrous camp atmosphere and the book oddly anticipated the later 1958 Hollywood turkey film Queen of Outer Space. The author attempted to spice up the stodge by having his hero being a man of the present who was deep frozen to be revived 100 years in the future when the novel is set. He's given a mechanical heart which is supposed to help him become conditioned for space. Don't ask how. The book's cover was by Ron Emelton, an up-and-coming young British artist, noted for his strong figure work and beautiful colouring. He was not so hot on scientific scenes, so tended to illustrate action sequences on his science fiction cover work. This one showed a beautiful girl watching two men astride grotesque alien fish, dueling with spears. It gave a fair approximation of the lurid content, actually illustrating a scene in the book. Four titles had been issued between July 54 and April 55, none of them any great shakes of science fiction novels, but with attractive cover art. The sales were sufficiently encouraging 
for Wardlock to decide to reissue the first two books in the Target Books paperback series in June, uh, June 1955. These releases were followed up in July with another hardcover by Charles Carr, Salamander Roar, which we see here. Uh, this uh, book described the trials and tribulations of the human colonists on their adopted planet of Bell, sequel to the first one. It may have been inspired by Wally and Bomber's uh, After Worlds Collide, because there's a conflict between different surviving human factions, complicated by mysterious aliens, the salamanders, beings who exist at high temperatures and seem to be constructed largely of pure energy. They were vividly uh, depicted on another eye-catching Harold John's dust jacket. But despite some imaginative touches, the story was not particularly inspiring and it maintained the mediocrity of what had gone before. Incredibly, Wardlock reprinted the third and fourth titles in paperback at the end of the year. The books were physically quite well made, but that's the only positive thing that can be said about them. At this point, Wardlock suddenly realised they'd been publishing mainly utter crap. The next development was surprising. The appointed author, Lance Seifking, that's, that's uh, Lance Seifking, the back cover there. The appointed Lance, Lance Seifking, as we see uh, on the back there, they appointed him to edit the science fiction line. He was a respected radio playwright and producer who'd worked for decades at the BBC. He was a successful author and had written a few borderline fantasy books pre-war, all with a literary flavour. Steve King's taste ran more to Wells than Flash Gordon. His editorial brief was clearly to make over the Wardlock space opera series into something more literary and respectable. The jackets of the books proclaimed the new title for the series, which we see there. It was no longer labelled as science fiction, but rather pretentiously as modern novels of science and imagination, advisory editor Lance Seifking. Seifking promptly chucked out the previous writers, admittedly no great loss. And there we see the first book in the series in September 1955, Introducing the new writer, Robert Conquest, with his first novel, A World of Difference. Conquest was a highly literate figure, a poet and a university educated diplomat. He was, however, a science fiction buff and become well known in the following decade for his literate and stimulating run of science fiction anthologies co-edited with his friend King's Lemis, the Spectrum series. A world of difference had a complicated plot of political and scientific adventure in the future centred around the discovery of an interstellar drive. It was, however, decidedly non-pulp. Steve King's own novel, uh, A Private Volcano, published in October 1955, came next. The two-colour jacket consisted of a pretentious line drawings of two utterly boring intellectual type faces and a pathetic attempt to portray an erupting volcano. 10% volcano, 90% smoke. The author probably thought that his central idea, a mysterious element ejected from a volcano that has the property of transmuting metals into gold with resultant uh, catastrophic effects on society, was original. In fact, a very similar idea had already been comprehensively done in John Russell Fern's Volgo Staten novel, The Catalyst, 1951. However, the treatment of the theme could not have been more different. Whilst the Fern novel was a wild and woolly cosmic romp, 
Sea of Kings stayed down to earth and concentrated on character and the human side in an unusually literate and interesting fashion. When the Moon Died by Richard Savage, November 1955, was a quite imaginative mainstream treatment of classic science fiction themes. Alien explorers discover a devastated Earth in the far future, wrenched from the solar system. They find a tape record left by a historian which tells of a double catastrophe, how mankind had been on the brink of destroying itself until scientists had taken control, cowing the people by destroying the moon as a warning of their power. But the scientific utopia degenerates into a spiritless anthill and rebels against the system repeat the mistakes of the past until mankind encompasses his own destruction. There was nothing original in the framework of the story. Once again, Fern and other pollsters had used the identical cosmic explorer of the ruins device several times. But Savage's novel was very well written and worked out. Savage has been identified as the pseudonym of journalist and novelist Ivan Rohr, who was better known for his excellent detective novels. In January 1956, we come to Pursuit Through Time by Jonathan Berg. And this concluded this particular series with an especially hideous arty cover. John Berg had written numerous science fiction novels for Panther Books and was a noted pre-war science fiction fan. His novel dealt comprehensively with time travelling into the past in order to alter the future. Burke was a careful writer whose imaginative plots were always worked out in human terms and never sensationalised. This interesting novel was in many ways a direct precursor to John Varley's 1977 classic story, Air Raid later expanded and filmed as Millennium in the James Cameron film Terminator in 1984. But Burke has never received any credit for his idea of time travellers snatching people about to die by natural accident so as to minimise repercussions on the space-time continuum. Burke's central theme of altering the future by removing key figures such as emerging dictators was of course heavily in indebted, as on most subsequent time tales, to Jack Williamson's 1938 classic The Legion of Time. Unfortunately, either Steve King or Ward Locke's art editor decided that the covers had to become more adult or arty to reflect the improved intellectual content of the books they illustrated. For some reason, British publishers or was a quite sketchy, shoddy illustration with good books. It is specious reasoning, and the Wardlock series probably faded out because of it. Had these later titles been illustrated by Harold Johns, they would today almost certainly be collected and remembered. Wardlock would, however, publish another science fiction novel in 1956, but they didn't identify it as such, nor was it part of the Modern Novels of Science and Imagination series. Crossroads to Nowhere, set in 2050 AD, was the first novel by Raymond Stark. It might have been a leftover from that aborted series, since it was long on philosophy and sociology as humanity struggles to rebuild after a devastating world war. Now, although they have abandoned the science fiction experiment, Wardlock would continue with the other genres uh, books, with definite science fiction elements continuing in the crime series, uh, crime and mystery series, such as Paul Capon's uh, book you see there, Wonderboat, and his Margin of Terror, 1955, and Barnard Stacey's Satan's Secret in 1956. These books were much better written than Wardlock's earlier science fiction titles. There are probably more yet to be discovered, so good hunting.